They're justified. They're ancient. They drive an old ice cream van. Today, episode 99 of Mark Talks About His Stuff, I'm going to talk about one of the finest pop groups in the history of mankind. The band for who the phrase Make Mine a 99 was enshrined in pop history forever. They have, I think, about six different names. They have four albums, 21 singles, three VHS videos, loads of stuff streaming, and I love them to bits. Uh, they are the Justified Ancients of Moo Moo, the Jams, the Time Lords, the KLF, the Copyright Liberation Front, the Kings of Low Frequency, 2K, the K Foundation, and no doubt lots of other puns upon the K name. Uh, I'm going to talk about the KLF because I can, because it's the 99th episode and because their single, Justified and Ancient, uh, has the catchphrase of Make Mine a 99. So here we are. And Make Mine a 99, uh, by the way, it refers to ice cream fans. So if you're not in the UK, you may be, understandably, a little bit confused by what is the relevance of Make Mine a 99. Well, uh, there is currently a world shortage of the Cadbury's 99 chocolate uh, flake uh, bar which goes in ice cream and was frequently when you bought a chocolate flake was said I'll make mine a 99 and then you put a chocolate flake on on top of the, the ice cream so there is the KLF justified and ancient with an ice cream van I should also point out that today I am aided and abetted by my trusty companion and friend Price it is his first birthday this week he is not particularly keen on appearing on video. He is particularly keen on sniffing all of my CDs. So we're going to start at the beginning because there is no finer place than there. And the beginning for the Justified Ancients of Moo Moo uh, is this 12-inch single here. All you need is love, um, which is both knackered and ancient. And since the Justified Ancients of Moo Moo built themselves around a mythology, uh, it's called Jams 23T, which implies the existence of 22 other records before its existence. That is absolutely not the case. The reason why um, I love this band is twofold. Firstly, uh, it was almost like an art project that happened to make great pop music. Secondly, they know that pop music is big and stupid and daft and dumb, and they just play to it. They coined their own genre, uh, which is called Stadium House, which is all the parts of Stadium Rock, but in a house music format. And some of this has not aged particularly well. Uh, what I should point out is all of this stuff was made cheaply and in a hurry in a small basement studio, which I think is somewhere in Camberwell or Brixton. Um, I do know where it is. I have promptly forgotten. So uh, this was the first single by the Justified Ancients of Moo uh, with the shag, shag, shag on there. And what you'll see actually looking at their logo is that they've already incorporated the A into what they call the Pyramid Blaster. And the Pyramid Blaster is, I think, a recurrent theme which appears all the way through all of their work, which is around, you know, drawing a comparison between the pyramid and the, st and the stereo or the boombox. Um, and it's just a, a fantastic bit of mythology. So the mythology of the Justified Ancients of Moo Moo are that in the year 992, uh, 1000 years before the band split, uh, they, they uh, traveled to the great lost continent of America and well, come on, it's all a load of bollocks, isn't it? They didn't do any of that stuff. It's just two blokes. Um, Bill Drummond, who's a Scottish uh, artist who now, who calls himself on the records King Boy D, and Jimmy Corty, who's uh, more, I think, perhaps more immediately musically minded of the two, that work together to indulge in the great thing of pop music whilst making art. Now, they they weren't uh, they 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 came up with the phrase and said we, we've always had a you know a rock element to our dance music, which I think is one of the best quotes ever by anybody. But we can also say, actually, there's always been a, uh, a pop element to their art. This was their first album. Uh, it's called 1987. What the fuck's going on? This, by the way, for the, uh, the more astutely minded of you, is not an original copy of it, because almost all of the original cop copies that were unsold of this album were withdrawn and burnt in a fire. Uh, the reason being is that the band had just decided not to get copyright permissions for any of the samples that they were using. Uh, the phrase publish and be damned comes through kind of loud and clear here. So this is a perhaps a surprisingly a, um, a Dutch counterfeit, uh, which was 
published in the, the mid to early 90s, um, which replicates the album mostly correctly, uh, but it doesn't have the, um, it has a, uh, a slightly different matrix number, I think. And if you haven't got a copy of the album, <laughs> let's face it, at the time I was buying KLF records, they were staggeringly expensive, these. These were selling for, you know, £100 or so. Um, I was quite prepared to take a copy that wasn't official for £10, and it's not as if the band uh, themselves were able to ever release it again. This is a, a scrappy album, um, which I think made it more out of you know ambition and hope than it is out of any artistry. The, the, um, the sampling that's on here, really interesting. Uh, and by interesting, I mean breaches copyright. So, for example, you have three minutes of the soundtrack for an episode of Top of the Pops from 1987. Uh, you have huge chunks of ABBA songs and other unlicensed samples that are on there. It was hastily, uh, by hastily, I mean very, very quickly, withdrawn. And uh, instead, we had this, which is the, uh, the only uh, currently legal version of the album that exists. 1987... The Justified Ancients of Moo Moo's The Edits uh, it now has so little music on it that it actually sold as a 12-inch instead of an album. And uh, instead, what they've done is they took a recording of the album and then they just deleted all the samples and gave you a set of instructions on the back as to how to recreate it. So, for example, um, you need a, a gap, a scratch in the guitar hook from The Monkey's Last Train to Clarksville, which is repeated eight times, building up the volume continuously. Uh, bring in a double scratch using your third deck of Little Richard's opening lines of Tutti Frutti. Make sure it's from the original speciality recording and one of his not one of his many later inferior re-recordings. And it's, you know, a really great, fun record. Um, and this is a really strange record to listen to because huge chunks of it are missing. So any time that there's anything that's in any way, shape or form, uh, copyright infringed, they just press the silent button and then present you with instructions as to how to recreate it on the back. This is considerably easier to get than uh, this version here. But as I've said before, neither are particularly easy to get these days because the KLF and the Justified Ancients of Moon Moon deleted their entire back catalogue when the band split. Uh, it's never been physically reissued in any way, shape or form. I think the next thing that came out, and again, this is this is a, a primitive uh, and, and, and sam sample-alicious, I think is probably the best phrase to use for it, release. This is a single called Whitney Joins the Jams. Here is a promotional one-sided 12-inch of it. I don't know if there was actually a proper commercial release of Whitney Joins the Jams. Um, but it is uh, a, a track with huge parts of Whitney Houston's I Want to Dance with Somebody over it in the middle. Um, although it is slightly different, it plays at a slightly different tempo uh, to match the uh, 120 BPMs on the 12 inch. Like all of these, this one is knackered because they're all old and in the 80s. None of us were thinking t too far into the long term about, well, what's the future going to be like? We were like, you know, we're just going to buy these records and we're going to listen to them and we're going to dance around the room. Because when all these came out, I was about 14 or 15. Uh, I didn't join the KLF story uh, or I wasn't didn't become a fan of them until a little bit later, which I will get to shortly. Um, this is the first actual KLF record released by the KLF as a band. Uh, this is Burn the Bastards and backed with Burn the Beat. The first 12-inch uh, single uh, called KLF 002T. So this is the first KLF record I think that there is, although the KLF had appeared in another form on a band called Disco 2000. Around about the time of the uh, the Justified Ancients of Moo Moo releasing their second album, which we have here, uh, which I don't think has got a title, actually. It just says the Justified Ancients of Moo Moo. Uh, this is their second album. And on the back of the second album, by the way, you can see lots of burnt copies of the 1987 LP and on the front you can see uh, them in their vehicle Ford Time Lord a time traveling car that's made of pop records uh, this has not been on CD 1987 has not been released on a CD these were all only over on vinyl um, and probably on streaming services now and uh, this is a again it, it reminds me a lot of the kind of very very primitive sampling technology that we had in 1987 you know the 
the the biggest size sample rate that you had was probably something like 48k the biggest size hard drive you had was something like 256 meg you know it, it was very limited to getting samples of no more than about eight seconds and so it became very much hampered and constrained by the limits of technology so really pushing the absolute limits of what the technology can do to create new material and this is something that, that a lot of bands that, that were around at the same time were doing really really pushing very inventively and very creatively the absolute limits of technology but like early cgi the last starfighter if you've seen that um, what it does do is it's now dated a little bit by its sonic production so listen to it and you go well it sounds like two guys with a really cheap crappy bit of kit apart from that cheap crappy bit of kit it wasn't cheap and it wasn't crappy it was probably you know cutting edge for the time uh, that it came out and bands uh, like pop Elite itself and later on jesus jones uh, were doing rough and beastie boys as well actually were doing all the same kind of thing as they were pushing sampling technology to its absolute limit its apex and um, there's a very specific sound around about 1987. Popley itself, The Shaman, Beastie Boys, uh, Justified Ancients of Moo Moo and KLF. And they were all just absolutely straining at the leash to do more with the limited uh, abilities that technology gave them. This second LP wasn't deleted, wasn't thrown into a fire, wasn't reissued with loads of samples on. Um, but what it was, was... Uh, you know, not particularly great. You can see that why the band weren't absolutely huge at this point, because the sound just didn't let itself to it. They were still doing um, art and music as, as basically a bit of a fucking jape, you know, a huge giggle. And here's the, uh, the, 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 one of the more recent kind of jams singles. It was followed up the single off the album was Downtown. Uh, which I think features uh, a huge sample of Petula Clark's Downtown on there. That's Jams 2017. So I'm probably presenting these out of sequence. And I should have checked the catalogue numbers, but I didn't. Because I am lazy and uh, I'm also only human. Uh, now, when most people first start to hear about the KLF was around about the release of this uh, the Time Lords, Doctor in the TARDIS, a number one single. And what a fabulous way to start your pop hit career with this. Um, now, the Doctor in the TARDIS, in case none of you know, very, very British, very silly, very stupid pop record, which takes the, the themes and drum beats from uh, Gary Glitter's Rock and Roll Part 2. Mm, yeah, and uh, the Doctor Who theme, and then sets it out into being a pop music epic uh which takes takes all the stupid dumb stuff out of you know glam rock doctor who mashes it all together and then says that a car called Ford ford time lord recorded it there is by the way i'm afraid to tell you more than one ford time lord in the world and as a result there is currently uh, a number of, there is a blog which actually goes down to try and find out well, how many ford time lords were there the answer is four I think, of which there are two which are roadworthy and there is one um, recreation of Ford Time Lord, uh, which is, I think, in somewhere like Brazil, there are two that are currently roadworthy in the UK uh, that I checked. So, yes, if you you may very well see the Ford Time Lord out and about while driving around Swindon or Elephant and Castle. And if you do, it may be an original Ford Time Lord or it may be a restored version of the uh, Yank Cop Car. Uh, apparently, Ford Time Lord appeared in Superman 3. Uh, but here we are. So, this is where I came into the KLF. It's where a lot of people came into the KLF. And they just thought, well, this is a crazy bunch of of, uh, of art people that, that have just decided to make a, a novelty record. In fact, it was so much of a novelty record that they ended up writing a book about how to have a successful record called The Manual. Uh, here's the 7-inch of it. Um, and there is also, by the way, a remix 12-inch uh, of Doctor in the TARDIS. Here it is. Gary joins the jams, uh, featuring the, the disgraced pedophile Gary Glitter on vocals. Uh, damn it. Uh, luckily, I haven't got the picture disc, which has got Gary Glitter standing on top of Ford Time Lord. I don't think I've ever listened to this record, actually, since that news came out. And this was also followed up by Compilation LP. Here it is in its original shrink wrap, uh, The History of the Jams. Uh, and since the second album wasn't released in the US, I think this might have been the first one that came out, which has a, an inner sleeve 
around the history and the story of the jams, aka the Time Lords. Lots of reviews that are in there, and it's got pretty much all of the A side seven inches and singles and best ofs on uh, one vinyl LP, ending with Doctor in the TARDIS. Now, there was a, um, as I said before, there was a KLF book called The Manual. Uh, which I got out of our local Birmingham library when I was growing up in local Birmingham, um, which tells you exactly how to create a pop hit and how to create a number one. And for these purposes, I have to pause the video and get the manual off the shelf where I've left it. And here it is, the manual, which, by the way, I got signed by Bill Drummond in 2005. I really wish I brought my copy of The White Room along, but it was a book signing and not a record signing. Uh, but what we do have is um, about 100 or so pages. Uh, originally, it was published in A4 format. The reprinting, this version here, is much, much smaller. In fact, it's probably around about the size, just, just slightly bigger than a CD. Um, and the manual, um, I remember someone saying to me, I can't get into a group that's got to have a manual to understand them. I was like, no, that, that's not the point. You know, this, this is a, you know, one of the, 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 the funniest books around pop music that's ever been written. So if you're you know, uh, studying pop music as an art form, this is an absolutely essential bit of reading. Because what this is effectively, it breaks down the entire structure of pop music and then lovingly lampoons and satires it whilst also at the same point telling you how to create what could very well be a number one hit single. By the way, if you remember a very bad novelty single called Idlewise and bring me the head of Idlewise, I believe that they uh, followed the instructions in this book to create their pop single, bring me the head of Idlewise and therefore it is their fault, the KLF's fault, that Idlewise had a hit, mute, had, had a hit single. Um, but uh, uh, it very clearly just lays out what you need to do, how you need to do it, and uh, what steps you need to take. And it says, we guarantee to refund the complete price of this manual if you are unable to achieve a number one single within three months of the purchase of the manual and on the condition that you have fulfilled our instructions to the letter. I have not actually claimed a refund because I've not actually made a record, um, but it's just... <laughs> hilarious the fact that you know to um to the klf i suspect actually that somehow just making records uh were, were just an enormous love letter and a laugh at the same time now the the place where i came into being a fan of the band uh was early 1989 and on the um hot on the heels of the release of uh doctor in the tardis um the klf invested all their money into uh, making a film called The White Room, which shall become relevant later on, because I've accidentally missed out an important part of their career, which I'm going to have to kick myself for, because somewhere in here, and I need to go and find it, is a record by an act called Disco 2000. Uh, Disco 2000 are a very, very um, overlooked kind of secret part of the KLF's history uh, but it's very very important that you know about them. Um, started in 1987 Disco 2000 with the two backing vocalists from the Justified Agents of Moo Moo including Cresta Corti who's uh, Jim, Jimmy's w then wife um, and the Disco 2000 effectively were the KLF trying to make really blatant, really obvious Stock Aiken and Waterman style pop music. They did three 12 inches. One's called I Got a CD, that was never on CD, only on vinyl. One's called, uh, I think it's One Love Nation, which is a remix of Candy Store off the second Justified Ancients of Moo Moo album. The third one is Uptight, and Uptight is a cover version of the Stevie Wonder track of the same name. And it is exactly 100% the type of thing that Banana Rama or Sonia or uh, someone working for and with Stock Aitken and Waterman would have done. You know, it's a slavish recreation and parody and satire and, and completely poker face kind of attempt to have huge, huge hits in the same style of Stock Aitken and Waterman just taking all those old songs and then bringing them back into, into circulation. Um, I haven't got the first two 12 inches because I completely forgot they existed until this afternoon. I do, however, have Uptight on 12 inch. And here on the back is uh, Cresta, who is now uh, a laboratory technician and, and research academic, I think, in Portsmouth. I don't even know why I'm telling you that. 
Um, but where I came into the Kalev story, and this is where the chronology gets a little bit confused to me, uh, was with an appearance on a double album um, called Independent Top 20, I think Volume 7. It was two, two LPs. I bought it from a, a record shop called, I think, Highway 61 Revisited in Birmingham for something like a pound, and it had 20 hit indie tracks on it on two LPs. And one of the tracks that was on there was by the KLF, and it was Kylie Said to Jason. Kylie Said to Jason is one of the finest, greatest most amazing lost hit singles that never was. I think this one made it to something like number 85 in the UK charts, and they really, really pushed it. I remember seeing a video for it on, I think, uh, a late-night British TV show that played at about 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. I forget the name of it now. Uh, it showed on ITV in the middle of the week. I used to set my timer to record it and watch it, and that was where I got all my indie stuff from, um, because it wasn't on the radio, it wasn't on television. I had no way of knowing what the records that I heard actually sounded like. So, for example, I'd buy The Enemy, I'd buy Melody Maker, I'd hear about this band called the KLF, which is the guys behind, you know, the Time Lords, and they're doing their own sincere pop music, but I'd never hear it. In order to hear it, I'd have to buy it, and I didn't have enough money to afford to buy it, so I'd have to record it off the TV show, uh, it later morphed into Gary Crowley's The Beat, by the way. Uh, and I think it, I can't even remember what it was called now. But they showed this and I was like, this is bloody brilliant. And so to me, you know, if you like late 80s duos, like, let's say, uh, Pet Shop Boys, Beloved, uh, New Order, this is a great lost classic of the era. It's the most shameless wonderful sincere love letter to pop music that i think i've heard in a very very long time it's just a fantastic track and it, it staggers me that apart from a cd single um it's never had a, a, a kind of like a legitimate cd release ever since and so i was like right that's my band i love that band and i'm going to go and listen to them and i'm going to listen to the hell out of them um whilst they they kind of like go on a weird and bizarre journey throughout the rest of their careers. Now, at the same point, the KLF were, were preparing uh, a soundtrack for uh, a film which they were making using their money from Doctor and the TARDIS. Uh, and this is the Carly Said to Jason 12 inch that has a couple of remixes on it. Uh, and again, you can see that they really weren't taking themselves particularly seriously because they're setting themselves out to be, you know, you look at that and you go, well, that could be yellow actually you know they're both wearing uh fake comedy mustaches and they're, they're already starting to label themselves in, in iconography so one of the things that about klf i think we're really really good at was branding they were really good at sticking their logo on everything that they did and letting you know who you were listening to so um although this became uh, more obvious later on uh for when they did um then this is the, the, the remix 12 inch of uh, Kylie Said to Jason. Kylie Said Harder, I believe. Uh, and the A side mix is called Trans Kylie Express. I mean, what fantastic names for, uh, for remixes. I have no memory of these remixes at all, by the way. Uh, but at the same point, they also produced a soundtrack to their work, which they called um, <coughs> The White Room and a Dat of the White Room were circulating uh, and it later became a bootleg CD. The early version of The White Room that's currently on YouTube called The White Room, the original director's cut, is uh, is not the version that's on this, by the way. It's slightly different, uh, but this is an early configuration of the soundtrack to The White Room, uh, which I think was a cassette which went alongside the original film. Um, their discography is really, really complicated. In fact, it's so complicated, I've forgotten a couple of things. And the first thing I've forgotten, which I should mention to you, is that I showed you the History of the Jams LP earlier on. It was released in the UK as the Justified Ancients of Moo Moo's Shag Times album. This is the first CD uh, by the Jams, or the KLF, uh, which was released. And again, you can clearly see right from the off, they're very good at branding. Now, there are two versions of this album. Uh, they came out. One was pressed by those charlatans at PDO in Preston using a fake lacquer or a, like a you know a poorly constructed bit of ingredients, which therefore meant that the CD is quite literally flaking off. The version to get on CD, and you have to be really really careful, is not the one manufactured by PDO. Uh, it's the one that's manufactured by I think ICM, and that is a, a CD company 
in Sweden or Norway. Um, so the only way you can get shag times that doesn't fall to bits is if you get this version, which as it happens, happened to be the version that I've got. Uh, but at the same point, I need to go back into the White Room movie. Um, and the band released uh, the first of a series of singles under the Pure Trance name. Uh, this is What Time Is Love, the Pure Trance 1989 classic version. And again, I saw this for the first time on British TV, recorded late at night. It's like very ambient, very pulsing trance track that's very, very minimal. It sounds like a Kraftwerk B-side from 1977. Uh, and the video is, is just seven minutes of Ford Time Lord driving around deserts. Pretty much all the entire footage that's also in the Carly Said to Jason video, but with considerably more boring backdrops. And What Time Is Love was enormous, actually. Um, now, I wasn't old enough to go to nightclubs, and now I'm too old to go to nightclubs. Uh, but at the time that What Time Is Love came out, I think it, it played in the, you know, the chill-out rooms in various clubs, and the, and the band decided that they were going to start doing a series of, of pure trance singles. Here is a, the second pure trance single, 3am eternal that track will turn up again later on and again pure trance they did three or four um, well they did three officially released pure trance singles that are absolutely brilliant and they also recorded two pure trance singles that didn't make it out uh, this is the 3am eternal i think it's the blue danube mixes i think of um of it let's find out by checking and uh, the lovely pink sleeve here Ah, right, so it's the uh, the Blue Danube mix and the original edit and the Moody Boy and 3pm Electro mixes on this 12-inch. So there were no strangers to remix culture at this point. And sometimes you might think, well, the Caliph actually only wrote one song and they just released about 4,000 remixes. You're not far off the truth there. Um, and since What Time Is Love was quite popular, uh, allegedly uh, a number of sound -alikes were released including this one by the KLF so the What Time Is Love remix 89 um, whether this is the KLF or not I have no idea um, and uh, it sounds a lot like the KLF but it sounds like somebody trying to sound like the KLF at the same time and so in fact the first proper KLF release as an album uh, is this the What Time Is Love LP which contains six mixes of What Time Is Love, um, the original KLF version, a version by Dr. Felix called Relax Your Body, which is the same track, but with some guy going, relax your body, mm, over the top. The KLF's Italian mix, which I've just shown you on the 12-inch, a track called Heartbeat by Liaisons D, which again is more, more versions of What Time Is Love, uh, a No Limit dance mix by an act called Neon. Again, these could all be the KLF under another name. And then finally, a live version recorded at the Land of Oz nightclub, on the 31st of July, 1989. Um, it's it's not the most interesting LP to ever listen to this, actually, the What Time Is Love LP. Um, there are also two more pure trance singles which didn't come out and were only pressed in very, very limited quantities. One's called Deep Shit, and I think the other one's called Turn Up The Strobe. Uh, as well as also remixes of Magruder Eterna, which turned up on the CD single of Kylie Said to Jason, and I haven't got that. There was also uh, a pure trance version of Last Train to Trans Central. I highly suspect this is a bootleg version of it, because I'm not sure how many copies were released or made it out. Uh, but again, this cost me about £5. I looked at it and I went, oh, that's in really, really, really good condition, but it might be a you know, a bootleg repressing, um, I, I don't really know. Now, the KLF then had wasted all their money from Doctor in the TARDIS to make a film called The White Room, which, as it turned out, they didn't want to release, and a soundtrack to The White Room, which, as it turned out, they couldn't quite ever quite relax into actually fully releasing. Um, so, and, uh, so, what happened next? Well, solo work. Now, that's a bit of a surprise for you, isn't it? A couple of bits of solo work and an LP in its own right. Uh, this is Jimmy Corty's LP, Space. Now, Jimmy Corty was at the same time a member of an act called The Orb, who released uh, this fantastic double album called Adventures Beyond the Ultra World. Um, and apparently when Jimmy left, uh, Jimmy's contributions to the album were wiped and replaced. Uh, whilst Jimmy was working as a member of The Orb, 
they released a huge ever-growing brain that, that rolls from the centre of the Ultra World. I'm sure I've missed a word out of that. Uh, but this is an absolute 100% 1990s classic. Fantastic track. Um, do listen to it. And you can hear all, all the building blocks of the pure trance genre and everything that goes with it. And then, of course, here's the LP. But since Jimmy Corti left the Orb, he released an album called Space. Here is a, an unofficial CD version of it from 1999, which is, I think, eight, eight fairly relaxed ambient tracks um, that are built around the theme of going to space and well it's okay not amazing uh, and at the same time the KLF themselves released this absolute classic of an LP uh, this is the American edition of Chill Out uh, Chill Out is currently available in streaming form as Come Down Dawn because much like the other albums they haven't learned their lesson yet and it had a whole bunch of uncleared samples from Jimi Hendrix and Elvis Presley and uh, Preachers and things like that and, and I used to listen to this album loads either early morning or late at night and I would know every damn note of this thing come back fat as a rat get ready all that you know chill out is an amazing album it's one of the the best of its of its genre and it's probably also one of the first actually come to think of it that's aged perfectly the version that's streaming called come down dawn isn't quite so good so in the meantime tvt records in america never wants to miss a trick uh finally released doctor of the tardis backed with the uh, pure trans mix of what time is love as a cd in the us this is where it gets interesting if you didn't think it was interesting already because here come the hits baby here come the hits what time is love live at trans central a huge stadium house epic reimagination of the original pure trans classic and this is where i think the KLF's formula really really kicked in and oh my god it's glorious here's a german cd of it by the way um and uh it's the KLF featuring the children of the revolution now all the things that they did in stadium house come here so what you've got is you've got as i said before experts in branding so they're, they're also the experts in the tiny tiny hook that sticks in your head so all those sounds like moo moo and klf and justified ancients of moo moo and come on boy do you want to ride and you know all aboard and all those type of tiny little vocal hooks that you hear in a song and it's just one like tiny little thing and it's just chock full of riffs and sounds and things that you go oh god it's that one isn't it and of course when you listened to uh what time is love there was no mistake it was anybody else because they kept telling you every few seconds it was the klf aha uh aha -huh, uh -huh, and the justified ancients of moo moo here's the the remix 12 which which has mixes by um uh, Echo and the Bunnymen in their non Ian McCulloch period, uh, which is therefore probably terrible, and the Moody Boys, who uh, feature a rapper called Tony Thorpe, who appears on a number of their other releases. That was the first one of the Stadium House tracks. And the next one uh, is 3M Eternal. Here it is, 3M Eternal, uh, which is live at the SSL. And the SSL stands for the Solid State Logic, by the way, which is the mixing desk which is used but all you can see is you've got a visual identity an iconography you've got the klf in big letters you've got a cover it's like that on the back of every single one of them you've got the pyramid blaster logo at this point the band have really kind of mastered just the art of a branding presentation you knew what you were going to get you were going to get uh, a fantastic bit of stadium house no doubt with people going moo moo and come on boy do you want to ride um here's the the 12 inch which is remixed by the moody boys um, one of them speeds up and slows down. That mix is a bit crap. Uh, there's also a couple of CD singles. Here's the, the UK version, and here's the, the German remix CD single of 3AM Eternal. And, and it's just fantastic songs to just listen to and just have a fucking boogie and just go, yep, it's fantastic. At the same time, by the way, they remixed Depeche Mode's Policy of Truth. Uh, very interesting but not perhaps uh, particularly fantastic. Um, a promo 12 inch turned up. Here it is, uh, Make It Rain and No More Tears, uh, which was out on the 2nd of March, 1991. So it was played in clubs. Uh, and this is a, a promo 12 inch, not commercially released uh, for this 
Buzzy, uh, I think probably one of the best albums of 1991, The White Room by the KLF. Um, it's a fantastic concept LP. Uh, as I said before, it takes all the, the things around Stadium House, the band's iconography, the branding, the use of crowd samples, the use of introductions. The side one sounds like a live set in a rave club. It, it's all sequenced so that everything all runs together as one 20 minute burst of noise. And then side two, you flip it over and you've got a very kind of relaxed, um, far more mellow kind of blues techno thing going on with uh, Bill Drummond doing all the vocals around it. And uh, this is just a classic, classic, classic LP. Um, and of course, highly deleted, not available uh, anymore, I'm afraid to say. But uh, hard to get on vinyl, and obviously played quite a lot because in 1991, the KLF were the biggest selling duo uh, in, in Britain, which is pretty surprising. Uh, and the LP, well, of course, I've got a CD release here. Uh, and they were very clear on the CD on the CD release, by the way, to specify that there was an LP mix of Last Train to Transcentral as opposed to an alternate mix of it. Um, that's the only way in which they differ. Is they specify these are LP mixes because the next single is again one of the finest singles ever, Last Train to Transcentral. I've recently uh, spent some time remixing this track and come up with a 21 minute epic version of Last Train to Trans Central, uh, which again, you can see by looking at the cover, there's the uh, the Pyramid Blaster on the back. And at this point, you know, they were just kids, just making a racket and having a laugh with the concept of pop. The video, for example, uh, for this has a KLF submarine, a KLF train, uh, there's a little model version of Ford Time Lord that appears in this. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a KLF plane actually somewhere in the background. Uh, they've got a scale model version of the Pyramid Blaster as a gig set. Uh, and then you kind of like the video shows the journey towards Transcentral, which is the name of the Pyramid Blaster here. Uh, and then they go into and on the stage where a short, where a, a version of the KLF perform in what is presumably meant to be a scale model recreation. It's dripping in iconography. And the idea that they, there's a band where built a huge room full of scale models and, and submarines and, and train sets and do all of that and they create their own world their own iconography and you kind of go yes i can buy into it and it's just a fantastic concept a fantastic idea that a band could be yes this band could be your life but also more than that is that they're treating pop music with the same kind of irreverence as you would you know the Bay city rollers and at the same kind the same kind of reverence as jesus building a mythology around a religion that happens to communicate with humans from another period in time using the medium of dance music and, and stadium house. Uh, and it's just bloody hilarious because they were never afraid to be silly. So, you know, the guitars that they use in the video for Last Train to Trans Central are, you know, huge, enormous sitars that clearly don't make the noise. And, uh, you know, then they play them with angle grinders and things like that. Um, here's the 12 inch of Last Train to Trans Central. There was, by the way, one last KLF remix, uh, which is here, the Moody Boys track, uh, which I think is uh, um, What Is Dub, and uh, the B-side has a remix by the Kings of Low Frequency, uh, which is basically a KLF track in, in all but name. And I don't even think that this track, actually, the, K the Kings of Low Frequency remix, is streaming anywhere. Uh, it's hard to get... Um, and it's surprisingly good, actually. That's the last KLF remix. There was also another single, perhaps not so well known, for one period only, the Justified Ancients of Moo Moo came back to life under the name of uh, the, the It's Grim Up North, uh, a 10 minute dark, steamy kind of honking epic thing, which is largely just a list of northern towns uh, with with the backup of its grim up north um, and uh, there's a promo 12 inch of its grim up north uh, here's your your standard seven inch uh, very very far away from what you would expect to be a hit but for some reason this was still a hit at the time um, and everyone was just like no oh, it's just the klf being silly sods we'll just live with that that's what they do they're just silly here's um the cd single of its grim up north again if you have any doubt who made it, it's a massive great big whacking letters on there. KLF. 
we're almost into the last last kind of straight. So the last original KLF single released in their lifetime was Justified and Ancient with Tammy Wynette. And again, the video for this is this brilliant alternate universe uh, set in the land of the KLF where, yes, they've got a submarine and Tammy Wynette is the queen of their land and she's bidding them farewell as the KLF go off as the Justified Ancients of Moo Moo and travel to another land to impart the vital message that pop music can exist using their ice cream van roaming the land. And uh, I... I should... It just makes me laugh every time I hear this song. I just think of just how much fun they clearly must have been having with all that money and just go, fuck it, we're just going to do silly stuff and we're going to get away with it because being silly is so, so, so underrated. Now, the last KLF single is America, What Time Is Love? And this is where Stadium House goes full stadium rock. Glenn Hughes, the uh, the voice of rock, according to the back, uh, does the vocals over a completely reimagined, re-recorded kind of rock stadium metal version of it. They originally wanted to get Axl Rose, by the way, but he never returned their calls. And uh, it's this fabulous 10-minute epic. Three minutes of it are just a section where the MC just shouts out the names of all the American towns he can think of, like Baltimore, Salt Lake, Minnesota. Uh, Utah, you know, and all that, while the crowd screams. The crowd, by the way, is a you know has canned recording from a Doors live album um, over the top, and it's just beautiful and silly, and it just comes in. Where can you go after that? You can't go anywhere after you've you've re-recorded your first big hit in a rock style, and then you've turned it into a you know an enormous parody of everything that it should be. Well, there is one place you can go, but you're not quite going to get there yet. And here is a jukebox 7-inch of America What Time Is Love, backed with Justified and Ancient in the days when they still did jukebox singles. The last KLF release is this, KLF versus Extreme Noise Terror, 3AM Eternal. So for the Christmas Top of the Pops, and Christmas Top of the Pops, they always had the theory that you had to go and appear on Top of the Pops, if you could, and perform your number one hit single. Uh, the KLF took time out from recording the album The Black Room, which apparently is the flip side of The White Room, which was never completed. Uh, and they were recording some of it with extreme noise terror. They re-recorded 3AM Eternal, performed it on top of the Pops, and then they gave away the 7-inch. Uh, actually, no, I don't think they did perform it on top of the Pops. I think they performed it at the Brit Awards in 1992, because I remember watching it around my friend Mike's house on television, going, oh my God, I can't believe they did that. And so... For the Brit Awards appearance, Extreme Noise Terror and KLF performed 3AM Eternal. Bill Drummond fired a fake machine gun into the crowd and then at the end shouted, the KLF have left the music industry. And that's where they left it. With a blooded sheep left on the doorsteps to the Hammersmith Odeon uh, with the logo, This Sheep Died For You, on it. That was the end of the KLF. And where else can you go after that? Well, after that, there's nothing left but the inevitable reformation. Uh, the KLF did release a single called Que Sera Sera, uh, but only in Israel and Palestine. Uh, they recorded a track called The Magnificent um, for uh, a charity here. But the last thing that they did um, was the deliberately bad reunion. So they re reunited five years later under the name 2K to release a single called Fuck the Manelium, which is a 13 and a half minute re-recording and remix of What Time Is Love, uh, with Zodiac Mind Warp on vocals, and uh, the uh, Acid Brass um, art project, which was inspired by the work of Jeremy Della, um, to create this huge, enormous, deliberately terrible reunion. And they then did a one-off reunion show at the Barbican in London, uh, which was roundly rubbished in the reviews. But the reason being, that was the point. They got the reunion in before anybody else wanted them to. They deliberately made it bad and terrible and cheesy. And they deliberately made it so that people would go, mm, no, it wasn't very good. Because every band reformed. So they'd already jumped that, that um you know, that hurdle, that shark. Uh, and they appeared on stage in, uh, you know, remote control wheelchairs, uh, deliberately wearing makeup that made them look very, very old in pyjamas with huge horns growing out of their head. I wish I'd gone to it, but I couldn't. But that's it. Um, that doesn't leave me very long, really. It really feels like we've rushed through everything the KLF have did, uh, did and did, did and done. Um, all their work reappeared on streaming near enough uh, at the beginning of the year. 
Um, and uh, the only other thing I'm going to mention is this unofficial release called Waiting for the Rights of Moo. And uh, it's based upon the soundtrack to a VHS tape called Waiting, uh, which they specially composed the soundtrack for, which is again an ambient album, and The Rights of Moo, which was an eight-minute film about the band going to the island of Jura in Scotland and burning a huge wicker man, because why the hell not? Um, unfortunately, I haven't managed to touch on anything that they've done since 1997, which means I haven't mentioned uh, a band called Kale Vela, or more correctly a label. I haven't mentioned the book Bad Wisdom, uh, here, signed by Bill Drummond and Zodiac Mind Warp. I haven't mentioned the book, 45, by Bill Drummond. I haven't mentioned Wild Highway by Bill Drummond and, um, and, and Zodiac Mind Warp. I haven't mentioned this book here, 17. Nor have I mentioned the return in 2017 of the Justified Ancients of Moo Moo in the form of this book. Um, Basically, the character for this huge, grandiose art project by overgrown school children that, that created incredible pop music and turned this into a huge, huge giggle. And did it because they could, because it was fun, and because, so, well, why not? Let's get a submarine. Let's get a model train set. Let's pretend that we're a, you know, a time-travelling police car. Let's pretend that we have a mythology around us and somehow they just showed to me that pop music could be fun it could be brash it could be stupid but most of all like all things the best thing about pop music is it makes you feel alive and it makes you feel like you're having a great time and i can't imagine how it couldn't have just been mostly an absolute huge fucking hoot to be in the klf and just go do you know what yes we're going to do it we're going to get tammy winnett to sing for us because we can we're going to get ourselves a submarine because we can and why not because it is there that is why people climb everest that is why the klf made records because it seemed like a good idea at the time and it made people laugh thank you see you again soon and be good in the comments bye